Good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending with where you're listening from. This is Chido and Christine, and today we are going to be speaking on mobile money in Sub-Saharan Africa. But obviously, it's going to be a case of Zimbabwe and Kenya. So I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but we we started with a conversation on fintech revolution in Africa, and there was a time where the panelists spoke extensively about mobile money, how it has not gotten into West Africa, and also how it's really blooming or it's becoming quite a vibrant sector in Eastern Africa. And then we decided to have a different conversation, again in a webinar on mobile money, particularly the revolution in two specific countries, Zimbabwe and Kenya, mainly because in the two regions, the in Southern Africa and also East Africa, those are the countries that have been pioneers or that have got mobile money payment systems that are that have been going on for a very long time. And quite a lot of you know interesting insights were shared. We decided to do yet another uh, episode, but this time being a podcast on again mobile money to try and answer some of the hanging questions that were left in the other previous discussions and tie up the conversation as it is and come up with recommendations and actually answer this question. Wuri, ultimately the goal is to answer this question, where is the problem in Africa? You know, if we seem to have something that is so innovative and is changing lives when we look at financial inclusion and security. So why do we still have to face this economic hardships? And I think it's here where it gets so real and we talk about it at the end. Today, um, yeah, like I said, I'm with Christian and Christian, you can introduce yourself and dive into the discussion. Okay, thanks a lot, Jido. And it's nice to be here speaking about mobile money. Um, and that's because uh, it's quite an interesting journey that she has gone through. And also it's not uh, common throughout Africa, yet within like a country like Kenya, where I am from and I am based, payment through mobile money is basically, I can almost say, personally, I use it maybe 99% of the time. And a lot of people, especially over the COVID period, in fact, uh, what happened Ch Chido was that uh, one of the things that the government negotiated for with M-Pesa, uh, M-Pesa is the payment a mobile money payment system that's used in Kenya, and it's offered by Safaricom, which is the biggest telecommunications company in Kenya. So, or it's not the biggest, but the one that has the highest uh, command of the market. So what the government did over the COVID time is to ask them, uh, please, if they could waive the fee for paying uh, for transfer of money or for withdrawal of money, that kind of thing. And they reported the transactions, I don't have the exact figures, but the transactions that went through the platform over that period were so high. So as you can imagine, over the COVID period, because we're trying to limit how much uh, paper money you use, then everything even pushed it even more to mobile money. So that's why I'm saying, like, between the beginning of, to, or maybe mid-2020 to right now, 2021, we have almost gone like full time using mobile money personally you don't even need cash you literally just go anywhere you can pay for anything using your mobile money and that's quite huge uh -huh. it's quite huge in kenya uh -huh. you know what uh before i even speak about mobile money in in zimbabwe i mean obviously that's my to-go place i also want to speak a little bit about something that i came across in South Africa, you know, as I'm currently staying here, and I found it very shocking. So what's happening is MTN has been trying to launch mobile money in South Africa. So <laughs> I didn't know about this. I find it very weird. Uh, it tried to launch in two, between 2012 and 16, and it failed, and decided again to relaunch in 2020, quite obviously because of this idea that you know how COVID has really sped up the whole process of e-commerce and digitalization and everything. So that was obviously a very good opportunity for MTN to think of, you know, relaunching this mobile money service in South Africa. And it's actually funny that it's working. They call it Momo, 
which is under MTN, and you it it's supposed to work exactly as how you know mobile money services work in Zimbabwe and also Kenya. But what I find very surprising, as I've said initially, is the idea that nobody knows about it that much. You know, I have been <laughs> I've been here equally with an MTN line, and I obviously get those you know more more notification but i've never really decided to ask myself what is it about and it is always because amongst most of africans cash is easier to use and there is no scarcity when we start looking at cash which then comes back to this conversation that we try to have when we were asking uh from the zimbabwean perspective the idea that for mobile for zimbabweans mobile money was not something that they had to choose for themselves it's something that circumstances Forced on them because cash was hard to come by, and it became an end, a, a, a means to an end, right? And it flourished. But now, this uh, the South African example then makes it so clear for us that in instances where you know EFT payments do work, where you know the, there is no cash scarcity, it's so difficult to actually launch a very successful mobile money service because mm -hmm. it. I mean, in South Africa, it, it obviously has a need and nobody knows about it and nobody is using it. At the same time, this is a second attempt. They tried doing this before and it failed, mainly because it failed to gain traction. So it then comes back to this idea that I don't think mobile money really is able to achieve the desired objectives, which is financial inclusion and financial security in, in countries where cash is readily available. Interesting. You know? Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think about it, but you also were in South Africa. I don't know if you knew about this initiative. Definitely not. Uh, in fact, I would say someone coming from, uh, like, let's say, like from Kenya or maybe from Zim, where you're so much used to, uh, like, paying on your phone, you know, like, you literally just, when you're going to the mall because you carry your, your phone because you're using it for other reasons, you can literally just go and, you know, you can do your shopping and leave. But then uh, in South Africa, you either have to use cash or you have to swipe your card. So for me, it had just to get to adjust mentally and know that just me carrying my phone, it, I could be stuck somewhere without money or without being able to do a, trans, a, a transaction, which is unlike Kenya. Literally, when you have your phone, you're fully equipped to even go on a trip because you can buy anything you need uh, because of that. And so I, I also didn't know about this, even if I know the other, you know, options of payment, uh, like the tap uh, payment, but then you, it works differently from mobile money because you need it internet and a smartphone so that you can scan the code mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But I think also to, add, to, to comment on what you said, for countries where there is no shortage of cash, maybe that's why mobile money doesn't peak much. But in Kenya as well, it wasn't shortage of cash, actually, that pushed this uptake of the mobile money. I think as was mentioned in the last discussion, it was more, uh, if I can give the setting of like how uh, Kenya looks like for someone who, who, who is not very familiar, is that uh, there is the urban setting, like the towns, and then there's like the rural areas. So and normally what happens is that over uh, in the rural areas because uh, there's a, ma a good majority who live in the urban areas but also in the rural areas and then there's the whole thing where you need to send cash uh, maybe to people to help them and then uh, so it, it was that sort of thing the only way you could have done it is either send the cash through someone you know or because our postage system you can't say is the best. You couldn't spend a, a, a significant of amount of money to send someone to take cash to possibly your your sister who is lives in a very far place, rural place. You, you didn't do that, use courier service or anything. So it was more of a situation where uh, you, people who are working in the urban areas need to start sending or helping people in the rural areas. And unless someone is actually physically traveling there, it becomes very hard for you to send even emergency help. So what MPS actually came to uh, do is that you need to send almost emergency cash. Someone needs money quickly. There's no one you can send. So now this, that's how actually MPS started. And if you see like a lot of, or not well started, but that's one of the things that propelled it. 
so that if you see like most of the marketing that was done like in the media you would find someone mm-hmm. who is in the rural area uh, they just you know they are a farmer they, they they have no time even to go uh, to the nearest market and now what uh, empresa marketing would say is that even that person who is so cut off from uh, the urban life can actually now receive payment and it it was writing mm-hmm. on that thing and you could see a lot of their products also they said were targeting people who are completely cut off from what you could say is the internet and that kind of thing and that's why it runs off internet and that smartphones it's just any phone you have with no internet you get mobile money and then also the other thing to say is that the uptake also increased because there's a lot of you know demand for you know like quick payment systems even for people like traders and that kind of thing there's a lot of money exchanged on the mpesa platform so maybe if, like in a business if uh, so how it operates is that if i have a shop let's say for instance and people want to come buy from me there's a way you can just get a quick number that you can send money to and they receive it so again it made payments for such trading uh, much secure so i think uh, from the kenyan perspective that was more the approach that has propelled use of mobile money chido um i i can say also the same for for zimbabwe in a way uh, over and above the whole case situation that i've constantly lamented it was also yeah an idea to try and make money is the accessible to or for people that you know financially excluded but you know I, if you look at i was i was looking at uh you know countries like namibia apparently it's believed that about 77 to 80% of namibians are banked right so these are people that have got access to you know banking facilities and all that and because of that it has been why mobile money hasn't really you know so much noise they do actually have it, it you would almost be surprised that everybody talks about mobile money in southern africa they get to point bubble because of the famous uh, echo case but botswana you know has got a mobile money pay has got more platforms they saw to Mozambique Namibia South Africa like we've said Eswatini Zambia and Zimbabwe but again the larger population of people in southern africa that use mobile money are in zimbabwe with, with when when initially a, a study was done you know it was noted that about 8 million people in zimbabwe are mobile money subscribers right which is so much of a huge number compared to probably 1 million in Botswana or another million that is you know in in Namibia and if you then look at the reasons why uh this has been so it's not yes the cash system like i've said but it comes back to this overarching idea that banks are underdeveloped right the banking system the financial service sector itself is underdeveloped in Zimbabwe and then you have countries like Namibia South Africa that have got the financial service system or sector that is so developed that has gone through the processes you know and has latched onto technologies and fully developed with a regulatory landscape that is also developed and progressive you would realize that mobile money doesn't really you know come out as an appealing means of of transferring money or conducting transactions because of the banking sector so i think in as much as we want to you know single out financial inclusion having uh cash readily accessible the main problem that we are failing to point to or that we are failing to acknowledge is the underdevelopment of the financial services sectors and i think this then answers that question that we try to ask in the in the, in the webinar to to see if it's possible for africa to start you know exporting mobile money products or services to other countries you can't you know export this facility or this service to a country that has got a developed banking system because you've got a lot of people that are banked you've got so many means of you know, transferring funds and getting and getting cash it would only work if these products or these services are being exported to countries that equally have underdeveloped the uh, financial services sectors just in some countries in sub saharan africa yeah chido i completely agree uh, because if you look at, like at the south africa uh, financial services sector it's like one of the really big sectors in south africa so like it's very well developed 
you can't compare that, you know, uh, like from the situation where Kenya was at when M-Pesa was starting. And as much as there's, fin- there's a sort of financial inclusion through mobile money services, because again, uh, it's easily accessible. And also, you see, the population within Kenya and the population in a different country are quite different, even from like the, the skills that they have, how educated they are, uh, how much knowledge they have on the banking side of things. It, it, it may not be as, as advanced as even like developed countries. And that's why M-Pesa, mm-hmm. which is like a very, you just need your phone. You just need to know. I just need to transfer my money from here to there. I just know, need to know my phone number. I, I agree. It's quite a different kind of environment than it would be where someone even has to get like a debit card or a credit card. It's quite different. The environment in sincerely is quite different when you look at uh, why this product is working very well. And I think though, uh, what someone coming from outside these regions, you know, like Kenya and Zim or within uh, to East Africa, it, it's a very different perspective they also would need to have. So like for someone uh, coming and wanting to possibly even set up an online payment system, in Kenya, for you to have a successful mobile payment system, you need to have mobile money. That, that's mm-hmm. unlike someone else where, you know, like on Amazon, if you check, you use your debit or credit card or PayPal, that kind of payment uh, system for other platforms. But in Kenya purely, if you have Empresa, it's possibly like enough for you to, to get all the payments that you need to capture on the platform. And on the other hand, if you don't have Empresa, you lose on a lot of uh, payments that could come through your platform. So if, so you can mm-hmm. almost see, Chido, it's almost like we are operating from two different uh, scripts when you think about like what's happening mm-hmm. uh, in this side of the world versus what's happening like mm-hmm. let's say in the US we are operating from mm-hmm. very different scripts so so i agree and mm-hmm. and i think the motivations for for like the situation as it is are quite different because of the you know like the status and circumstances that surround even the populations that live within Kenya and developed countries mm-hmm. yeah and and you know what i was then thinking about it from you know like a, a different perspective to say if mobile money in zimbabwe let's say was a, a means to an end right did it manage to do its job like did it manage to meet that objective because yes i i i do not believe that a lot of people in zimbabwe were unbanked you understand if we look at the statistics of people who were financially excluded it wasn't that much because i know every other person who has got a grandparent who probably stays in the rural areas at some point if they far if they're a cotton farmer a maize farmer and they produce it in mass that they have to take it to the you know to those other you know like the grain marketing boards or the cotton companies and all that at some point it, they had to open accounts you know we had uh you know, our postal service opening accounts for people getting patients in, 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 in these accounts and all these other things. So opening a bank account is not or was not for a long time in Zimbabwe a thing that was foreign for most people. Because I remember the moment I, I, I finished my high school, I went straight to open a bank account. Just as how, you know, when you, when you finish high school, you're thinking about getting an ID and a license and all these other things. So, now you look at it from this perspective that, like I said, it was a tool to just make sure that it alleviates the problems that were inherent within the financial service sector. The issue of cash and inflation and all these other problems that we've spoken about for a long time. But then the question is, did it manage to, to, to alleviate the problems to a lesser extent? Because for a short while, it was okay. People could make payments using mobile money. People could, it got to a point where you could do almost everything, including paying for a taxi with that. But the problem is people failed to understand that this was not supposed to be a permanent solution. It was supposed to be a temporary solution that also has these other benefits that accrue. But at the end of the day, the main problem that relates to the financial service sector had to be addressed. And because of that, it got to a point where, again, cash started being a problem, even within the mobile money services. So people started, you know, 
you know, a lot of corruption started happening within the sec within the within the service providers, where if you want cash, then you have to pay extra, and then you are charged a, a percentage and a premium, and you have to do this and bribe this person and do all these other things. You know, to an extent that that became also one of the other underlying reasons that the government had to cite when they were deciding to revoke the license. So my issue then becomes this financial products, whether mobile money or you know digital payment systems whatever that we're talking about that basically is you know technology driven and innovation that is technology driven within the financial service sector it cannot thrive if the sector is underdeveloped it cannot thrive if there are no uh policy and and regulatory frameworks that actually develop the sector you know, we can talk about fintech and all those uh, benefits that uh, the continent can accrue from all that. But if our banking system, or rather the financial service sector itself, is still underdeveloped, we realize that growth for this product will be stifled, right? And not only that, more harm is going to be experienced than good. So the first thing that most African governments have to do now is to make sure that they put in steps to actually develop the financial service sectors. They have to be developed. They have to go through the transition. They have to catch on to what's happening globally. And then we can start talking about innovation and these digital products and how they are so beautiful and exciting and, you know, easier to use. That's my thinking. Hmm. Children, I also think in addition to that, like if you see like for instance in Kenya, there's monopoly. Uh, like now what has happened is that, as I, as I would imagine even in Zim, which you can comment on, is that there's one huge telecom that's the one that's controlling the entire mobile money payment. It's almost like the others can't compete with them. And you see now what this happens is uh, uh, the financial services sector should be developed to be able to even compete at the same level because you can say maybe the other telecoms are not able to compete with Safaricom. But then the financial services sector should be able to come and uh, almost offer products that are equally competitive. Be and you know, the reason why that's important, first of all, it's the pricing. Because right now, when you are a monopoly, you can literally outprice others in the market. And then there's a time when M-Pesa is down, the Kenyan economy almost crashes because so much payments go through the platform. In fact, there's a time when the M-Pesa services are down. They have to send an apology because of how much business is affected even if it's within a period of like an hour in a day. So what has happened is that so much power has been placed in one person. Well, the finance, other mm -hmm. like fintech should actually be strongly pursued by the, whether uh, in, independent entrants or the incumbent uh, institutions, financial institutions, to see how they can develop products that equally compete on the same level. And also the other thing to say is that, you know, for financial services, most of them are in personal services. For instance, I'm not particularly concerned which, uh, which bank I bank with. If, um, if it, an efficient product is offered to me at a cost that is efficient, uh, that, that's affordable, that's not very high, then I have no problem moving from, for instance, M-Pesa to a new fintech. As long as it's efficient, yeah. enabling me to very efficiently, conveniently, and is not expensive. So that's that's the thing. That's a big room that that there is for someone to actually come offer a product that can compete equally. Because there's no reason why I should be so loyal to saying that I have to stick with my mobile money money payment system uh, on through Safaricom when someone else can give me a product. Because there's no personal relationship I have with with, with a financial institution. So, so I agree that there's, there's actually room, and not even room, there's need and urgent need, especially within countries where like there's such a monopoly tendency for people to develop products that can equally compete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what? I, I, I agree with you, especially when you start talking about uh, monopoly of the market, because I mean, this is an issue that everybody has been raising in Zimbabwe and dissertations have been written on why, on, on how that has been, you know, detrimental to the growth of not only the product or the service, but also the sector, you know, the broader financial service sector, because in a way, this affects that, the financial service sector. You have got Econet having monopoly of the market. 
you know i was so surprised when hillary was telling me of other mobile money platforms that i was not even aware of but they've been there for a long time in Vim, but they are failing to gain traction because there is so much monopoly in the sector and it's something that has to be dealt with competition it comes back again christine to this idea that the regulatory bodies that regulate financial services need to actually start doing their job you know it's always a good thing to to even start developing legal frameworks for things that you you are you are observing on the horizon but haven't really been introduced as yet in your in your, in your, in your jurisdiction you understand i get how when mobile money started there was no regulation for it but again that doesn't justify the trend that's still going on because if you then try to look at the regulatory aspect of it you realize that most countries do fall short and it is because of that gap in regulation and policy that has led to you know monopoly lack of competition stifling the market or you know all these other problems that even new entrants face it's so funny that in zimbabwe a parastatal like a state owned entity which is netway net one which offers also mobile services within the telecom service sector is failing to get into the mobile money market because that private company ecocash has monopolized the market so you see now that it becomes a bit dif- difficult because even when then most regulation comes into play and then it's probably you know unfair and all these other things you already understand that there is a history there is a long history of trying to strive for the market i think it's just a, a whole messed up situation if you think about it it is it is chido and i think there's so much to explore on this uh, our time is running out but i think uh, to give my concluding remarks on this is that i wish there was a product which i could have as an efficient way of pay, using to make payment that's competing with mpesa right now in kenya because that means that when i don't have uh, like money on my mpesa then there's this other a platform that i can quickly switch to and use for payment but you see now what has happened is that it's almost like a beehive. Uh, what businesses have done is that now they have come and they are trying to, uh, they are the bees and Mpesa is the hive and they are trying all to come and build, to come around the hive and surround it and build their businesses around this product. And now what has happened is again, it empowers that monopoly again and again. So that even banks now want to collaborate with Mpesa on how they can uh, offer banking products through Mpesa, or that someone, if, even if it's a business that you're starting that has to do something with a, a payment system, you, you have to build off Mpesa. And I am mm-hmm. looking forward, uh, like for instance, when WhatsApp say that WhatsApp pay at some point uh, will take off uh, to uh, different countries to see how that looks like, because that would be a, another way of going about it. But if it was really uh, possible is let a Kenyan or even an African innovator come up with an, a platform that can equally compete in this market. Because again, uh, the monopolistic tendencies, you really don't want that to be how uh, your market looks like for all your transactions. Yeah, Chido, those are my last comments on this issue. That's amazing. I genuinely agree with you, especially when you say that you look forward to to a platform that actually competes. In not for me, it's not just that I need a, an application. I mean, a platform that can compete in Zimbabwe because we already have them, but they are not gaining access into the market. They haven't gained any traction. So for me, what I would want to see in Zimbabwe would be a clear and sensitive regulatory framework for mobile money products or solutions that are designed in a way to allow free and fair competition. Because we can't start, I mean, we all, it, it's, it, we can now open a whole different discussion that can last longer on this platform once we start talking about the benefits of, of fair competition in the market, right? Free markets, they thrive on competition and competition has to be regulated. So as long as there is, you know, there's monopolistic tendencies and all that, I feel like ultimately the person who gets to suffer is the end user because once once there are no competitors in the market you are forced to accept what's being offered the high and exorbitant uh, transaction transactional costs the delays sometimes 
um, you, you, we would receive a message from Echo K saying we are, we are doing our etern, internal, you know, fixing problems and all these other things and, and, and Echo Case is going to be down for two days. But then this is your only source of payment, you know, and you have got emergencies. There are things that are going to require you to make payment. How are you going to do that? That's why we need equally competitive mobile money solutions, like you say, so that you have an option. And also, it also helps us as the end user to choose Echo Cash because we want the services and not because we have no option. And that's what's literally being forced down our throats. So we, we obviously, sometimes Echo Cash sends a message and says, we've reviewed our policies and we've decided to add these fees. We can't protest. You know how it's easier now to protest uh, not going on WhatsApp and going to Signal. We can't do that because we not we don't have other competitive uh, platforms. So I, I think it comes back again to regulation. It comes again to having policy frameworks that are progressive. It comes also back to developing the sector in a way that actually makes sure that you know we are able to absorb all these financial products in a manner that doesn't one harm the end user and secondly stifle growth for new entrants or the existing uh, uh, project. That's what I would say in this case. Okay, uh, Chido, thanks for that. And I actually like the different perspectives that you have. And everyone who has been listening to this, please share your comments and share any thoughts that you may have on this. You can suggest uh, a topic that we could discuss further around uh, mobile money fintech in Africa. It's an area of interest because, as you realize, is that most transactions are going online, and that means that uh, payment systems are going to be a big deal. Uh, and it things that we need to be seriously thinking about within the Africa continent. Thanks so much for being part of this, and for me, it's goodbye.